Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, great conference. Uh, and uh, I will just uh, explain uh, quickly what you see on this first picture. Uh, this is burning of uh, Yulita Vujcic uh, installation Rainbow in 2013, and the uh, photograph was acclaimed a patriotic photograph of the year by one of the uh, right-wing uh, magazines. Uh, can we have another picture, please? Uh, introduction, Art as Politics in Poland. In 2000, in an essay titled Art According to Politics, Piotr Piotrowski wrote, quote, the political system created in 90s Poland maintains the authorities' policies, policy, which is neutral, but in fact reactionary or even repressive towards identity searching strategies. Conflicts around our body and gender reveal a war going on between the political establishment and open society groups, whose art according to politics is one of the few forms of expression. Culture, including art institutions, museums, galleries, art criticism, is a territory of war between advocates of the conservative society and supporters of liberal, free, and open society." End of quote. When he was writing about the authorities, Piotrowski did not have any particular party in mind. What he meant was a political and intellectual group that came to power after the overthrow of communism and combined economic liberalism with broadly interpreted faith in the teachings of the Catholic Church. Nineteen years ago, Piotrowski, uh, one of Central Europe's most perceptive art historians, wrote that culture in Poland is a territory of war, and art is one of the few forms used by representatives of the open society in their struggle for democracy. Today, Piotrowski's words have lost nothing of their relevance, and the points made below can only complement and elaborate on his ideas. It is worth adding that this war, which could be called a 30 years war, because it has been waged since the fall of communism in 1989, like any prolonged conflict, has been full of, full of ostensible truces and violent clashes. At present, we are experiencing one of the most heated moments of this struggle, in which the conservative side has an institutional, financial, and political advantage. In his essay, Piotr Piotrowski presented the idea of creating art as a way of, a conduct, of conducting political discourse. However, at the time he published his observations, only the liberal side used this kind of language. Conservative populists seems to be passive, only responding to provocations from avant-garde artists. This attitude changed as populist ideas moved into the political and media mainstream. We can see conservative populist evolution from accusing art of rejecting traditional aesthetic values and offending religious feelings to promoting their own artists who will express right-wing ideas using the language of contemporary art. Can I have a next slide, please? Jan Werner Miller defines populism as particular moralistic imagination of politics, a way of perceiving the political world that sets a morally pure and fully unified but, by fictional, but fictional people against elites who are deemed corrupt or in some other ways morally inferior. The central message spread by the conservative populists holding power in today's Pol Poland is that we are endangered by mysterious and harm harmful forces that are undermining our cultural identity. Such messages are usually grotesquely clumsy, but at the same time powerful and dangerous. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to give an example, Maciej Mazurek wrote on Polityce PL, a right-wing news and opinion website, that, quote, the fierce fight taking place for cultural institutions seems to suggest that they are very important, perhaps the last Polish bastions of cosmopolitan leftist international, which is a new incarnation of a communist party network, an activist who live by wrecking havoc and provoking conflicts. Sexual scandals and attacks on all religions, which are part of strictly political strategy, should be treated as such, and tales about artistic freedom are just a pipe dream. Anyone who knows something about the first stage of the Bolshevik Revolution will see that we are simply dealing with neo-Bolshevism." The author, 
raises the alarm that cultural institutions in Poland have fallen into clutches of leftist cosmopolitan international, which is introducing the first stage of the Bolshevik revolution. This type of reasoning has ceased to be absurd or funny because it is reaching a broad audience that interprets such words literally and easily absorbs inverted meanings and paranoid conspiracy theories. If you present the situation in this way, you can interpret your actions as justified self-defense. Such self-defense frequently consists of resorting to legal repression under the pretense of violation of Article 195 of the Penal Code in Poland, which punishes what is called offense of religious feelings. Pursuant to this article, if at least two people have an impression that their religious feelings have been offended and report the fact to the prosecutor's office, the latter launches the investigation into the matter. Needless to say, the category of offended feelings is extremely vague and in practice prevents any criticism of religious beliefs, especially in the field of visual art, culture, theater and film. Instigated by the media, activists present themselves as an injured party, defending itself against aggression and resort not only to legal measures, but often to physical attacks involving acts of vandalism. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is what happened at Zahenta National Gallery of Art in the year 2000, when an MP in daring action removed the meteorite from the sculpture of Pope John Paul II by Maurizia Catalan, titled La Nona Ora. A strong protest took also place during an exhibition at the Ujazdowski Castle in Warsaw. Can I have next slide, please? Uh, in 2013, when a group of praying protesters threw paint on the screen showing a work by Jacek Markiewicz titled Adoration. The work, which depicts a man leaning on a crucified Christ, was condemned as blasphemous and sparked protests by the high hierarchs of the church. Uh, and the next slide, please. Uh, these are the covers of the Polish right wing. Uh, uh, press that is very strongly supported by uh, the government. Mm. The fake news strategy, in all its glory, became part of the arsenal of Poland's right-wing populists in 2010. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the turning point was the crash of a presidential plane uh, near Smolensk airport. Anyone familiar with history and the mechanisms of conspiracy theories, such as those concerning the cause of and the course of the JFK assassination, could easily anticipate subsequent reports generated by politicians and activists whose main aim was to generate fear, suspicion, as well as sharp political and social divisions, with the help of an avalanche of increasingly fantastic reports and theories. Uh, their awkward impossibility at first provoked laughter and shrugs of the shoulders, but later they caused only disgust and fear of their unexpected effectiveness and impact on the audience. Fake news is an international offensive weapon used by populists and all persuasions, with Poland being no, no exception in this respect. After the populist government took over the public media, a casual attitude towards facts and all kinds of innuendo, manipulation and distortion became an accepted standard among their employees rather than a deviation from the norm. Victims of such information policy included those artists and art institutions that do not support the ruling party. The strategy used by the official media towards art is to create a scandal and to make cultural institutions responsible for hosting extremely tasteless and indecent events. The strategy is to adopt the so-called common man point of view, sympathize with this ignorance and present this deficit as a virtue which should be a reference point for a corrupt intellectual elite. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when Jerzy Misiałek, Misiałek, the newly appointed director of the National Museum in Warsaw, removed from the exhibition a work by the Polish avant-garde icon Natalia LL, he in all seriousness invoked a letter that the museum had allegedly received from a mother shocked by the fact that her kid had seen a painting she considered obscene. News uh, that is false or partly false, or probably true, usually uh, has its origin in a gray legal area so that it will be as difficult as possible for the injured party to defend itself. Uh, 
Place a disclaimer or win compensation. This is a technique brought to a perfection by tabloids. An item of news does not usually appear as the author's direct product. It is a report from a third source. If you take the risk of not citing other sources, you add question marks or edit the texts so that its content will be logically inconsistent and that the necessary association will be made only in the reader's mind. Properly fabricated information can be enhanced with commentary by an expert with an academic degree, whose opinion is based solely on the absurd thesis presented by the author. Another effective method is to add hosts of outrage from representatives of common people. Such operations can be steeped up by cooperation of populist activists and politicians as well as Catholic priests with pro-government local and national media. Fake news is the form of absurd accusation uh, and announced in local television, quoted by radio station, commented by a columnist of a weekly published in Warsaw, and then it goes viral to social media. Thanks to this, the fabricated content circulates, circulates continuously at various levels, and its impact reverberates like an echo. On the basis of a frequent, frequently quoted information, whose source has long been forgotten, the prosecutor's office may take actions to investigate the case, which makes the report even more credible. The narrative in right-wing media is to present progressive and avant-garde activists in culture, particularly theater and visual art, as leftist conspiracy, which, uh, with the help of Marxist ideology, supported by secret sponsors from cosmopolitan communist capitalist circles, wants to undermine the traditional family and culture, as well as healthy national and Catholic foundations of the society. Uh, next slide, please. What makes the narrative effective is referring to Stalinist propaganda paradigms, deeply rooted in the older part of the society, according to which the cause of all evil was always a demonized stranger in two incarnations, an external sponsor and an internal enemy who is an agent of hostile forces. This was the mechanism of a campaign launched in Hungary by Viktor Orban against the open society promoter George Soros. Identical techniques are used in Poland. To illustrate the, wrong, the, the working of this mechanism, let me give you three examples of media operations directed against the work of Poznań Arsenal Municipal Gallery over several months in the year 2018 and 19. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the target of these attacks was not art as such, but above all the liberal local government that funds the gallery. The attack took place in the time of local elections, which the populist right wanted to win at any price. In 2018, the 50th anniversary of Polish March, Prague Spring, and Paris My protest provided the gallery with an opportunity to hold a series of events titled Revolution Workshops. The purpose was not to talk about what happened 50 years ago, but to discuss how revolutionary ferment forms in today's world, how societies organize resistance and treats the face, and how today's dreams and utopias come true. Right-wing Radio Poznań, which used to be very popular and well-liked uh, just a few years ago, uh, used a 40-second fragment of performative lecture delivered by the Gine Pang group on the history of gynecology to accuse the gallery of instructing the audience how to abort pregnancy at home, which is prohibited by Polish law. Despite the absurdity of the accusation, the matter was picked up by the right-wing politicians and the, and the Poznań Archbishop, who devoted part of his sermon to the gallery during a Corpus Christi procession and investigated by the prosecutor's office. The fake news fabricated by right-wing propaganda functionaries was then spread by Catholic newspapers and government television stations. Uh, another slide, please. Another excuse for attack was Bedtime, an exhibition created by two artistic collectives, Coven from Berlin and Gerhut from Poznań. As early as two months before the scheduled opening of the exhibition, Radio Poznań reported that the gallery wanted to corrupt underage participants with an anal sex workshop. This wild accusation was picked up by local television station, which devoted a special program to the subject. As a result of the Coven Group artistic intervention, and to the, 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 the delight of the public, the television program itself 
became a part of the exhibition. An attack, another slide, please, uh, on an exhibition called 10 Minutes Break by photographer Bovnik and painter Zbigniew Rogalski coincide with a debate about pedophilia in the Polish Catholic Church. As part of whitewashing the topic and diverting the public's attention from the heart of the matter, government media reported that the professional group most affected with pedophilia was not priests, but bricklayers. The media also repeated the claim about minors being sexualized by the gay community. Bovnik and Rogalski exhibition consisted of series of photos that ex extremely formalistically presented a male nude. Talking about a curatorial guided tour for families with children, Radio Poznań journalist reported that, quote, young children with parents are looking at pictures of a naked man, end of quote, and quoted the, exp the expert's opinion. Quote, the psychologist, Bogna Białecka, head of a foundation for health education and psychotherapy is appalled by the event, convincing a small child that the view of a naked stranger is okay and natural is an element of grooming. By destroying its sense of intimacy, we make the child vulnerable to pedophiles. Grooming means a pedophile preparing a child for sexual act. The first element of grooming is to make someone accustomed to the nudity of an adult stranger, adds Białecka. However, the reporter failed to mention that the quoted psychologist is a Catholic activist and contributor to newspapers like Catholic Leader or Exorcist. Other right-wing media, citing Radio Poznań, reports, turn a single expert view into professionals' consensus. The PH24 website reports, psychologists, however, go beyond this dispute and warn against the damaging effects of such practices, and conclude the article with the following comment, quote, it is hardly surprising that the word of so-called art shocks minors with nudity, inviting them to the adult world. So do educators who want to sexualize school children. In both cases, the rule of parents is to protect their children from harmful content. All the more surprising is that it was parents who found a nude exhibition to be an appropriate place for their kids to commune with art and who accepted the gallery's offer." End of quote. And another slide, please. Conservative critics and media have always held the traditional view that the avant-garde language of 20th century art is immoral and degenerate. Such an opinion is shared by majority of Polish society. Attacking artists who use media such as performance or installation has become too easy to satisfy more ambitious columnists. However, the widespread belief that these technically suspicious forms are employed only by left-wing deviants, sick people whose only ambition is mockery, scandal, fraud, and manipulation, has slightly changed. It has turned out that paradoxically, modern means of expression can also be adopted to express conservative, religious, as well as nationalist and xenophobic views. A manifestation of these tendencies were two exhibitions, Timos, The Art of Anger, in Toruń Art Center 2012, and Rebellion Strategies in Poznań in 2016. Anger, rebellion, as well as an aggressive and uncompromising attitude are meant to be the hallmarks of this trend. Uh, next slide, please. Its patron is Stanisław Szukalski, a forgotten visionary who is now being rediscovered in Poland and who in the 30s created extraordinary and formally perfect utopian visions of Slavic state fascism, a system that never came into existence. In 2008, a critical and controversial analysis of Szukalski's work was made by another Polish artist, Piotr Kleinski, who used foam to reconstruct one of uh, Szukalski's work titled Stach Eagle and show it at New York's Gagosian Gallery. Uh, next slide, please. Today's patron of the conservative trend in Polish art is Zbigniew Warpechowski, an outstanding and once uncompromising performer who advocates nationalistic and xenophobic views. His 2009 sculpture titled What Else depicts a toilet bowl and a board featuring ideas such as culture, dignity, freedom of speech, faith, patriotism, honor, and motherland, each waiting for its turn to be flushed down by toilet. 
according to the artist. Varpechowski's attitude has lost nothing of his radical rebelliousness. What has changed is that today the artist acts as a mentor and teacher who opposes the evil represented by liberal cosmopolitan elites. It seems, however, that there is no rational criticism here. They are only insults full confidence in one's knowledge and the lack of any attempt to understand the problems of the modern world. And next slide, please. Jacek Adamas is an alumnus of the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw, member of a group of Professor Grzegorz Kowalski, former students who include the most recognizable Polish artists, such as Paweł Althammer, Katarzyna Kozyra, and, uh, and Artur Żmieski. Adamas is a sculptor and local activist. In his best-known works, he approves a various conspiracy theories related to the Smolensk plane crash. His installation, titled Mourners, depicts shooting target figures riddled with bullet holes. The name Smolensk underneath clear clearly suggests that the author identifies with the reports claiming that the crash victims were allegedly finished off with gunshots by agents of Russian special services. The work was displayed by the artist in front of Warsaw's Ujazdowski Castle on the day the plane crashed and after a few hours removed from the public view by gallery staff. Another work, Tusk 154, the title of a mobile sculpture is combination of Tu-154, the airline type, and Donald Tusk, the name of then Polish Prime Minister. For many years now, right-wing populists have been unsuccessfully trying to prove that the Polish Prime Minister took part in a plot to assassinate his political competitor, and together with Vladimir Putin, caused the plane to crash. Adamas is perfectly aware of the language, uh, of, the, of the huge potential of, of modern arts language to form a political message. However, his politically engaged works violate the ethical obligations of political art, one of which is to encourage us to think and ask questions. Rather than contributing to a critical debate, these works are part of a political witch hunt, which has brutally, by means of outright lies, helped to provoke a political conflict, which enabled populists to seize power. As Jacques Rancière wrote, quote, art is politics not because of the messages or feelings it communicates about the world order, nor is it politics because of the way it presents the social structure, conflicts, and identities of social group. Art is politics, though the very distance, through the very distance it keeps from its functions, through the type of time and space introduced, through the way it divides this time and populates this space, end of quote. And next slide. Perhaps less direct and more subtle are female artists' works presented at the Women of Faith exhibition, which was intended to serve as a manifestation of young female artists' attachment to religion and their spiritual experience of belonging to the Catholic Church. A photograph under the title Pieta by Alexandra Tubielewicz reversed the traditional order of the subject. This time it is a male that keeps on his lap the body of a dead woman wrapped in a white and red. What makes the otherwise interesting inversion of rules regressive is the work's symbolism of national colors and its romantic depiction of Poland, Poland as victim and the Christ of nations. And next slide, please. Ignacy Czwartos used to be the author of subtle paintings, compositions, whose style referred to Jerzy Nowosielski, the great Nestor of Polish painting, and the tradition of Russian avant-garde, or the Orthodox icons. The artist's most interesting achievement included a composition alluding to Malevich Black Square. However, the artist's close links with the community of football fans led to his artistic language coming to be used for different purposes. The series of paintings titled Everyone Has His Own Heroes is dedicated to post-war anti-communist partisans. The uncritical cult of those soldiers has become the instrument used by Polish right-wing populists populist to, to intensify the political dispute. The history of post-war partisans is complicated, as many of those units had nationalistic origins. In addition to fighting the Red Army, which occupied Poland, the partisans killed Belarusians and Jewish civilians. Today, the right-wing government requires Poles to clearly approve of those cursed soldiers without discussing the nuances of history. This was evidenced by the Polish Prime Minister publicly laying flowers on the tomb 
of the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade, a unit that undeniably entered into a non-aggression pact with the Nazis during the war. And the last slide. We could ask the question about the difference between the political art created by, say, Artur Zmieski and the art of uni his university friend Jacek Adamas. Are their activities symmetrical, differing only by opposite directions of their thinking? Is this a Piotr Piotrowski? Put it, art according to politics of art in the service of politics. To conclude, I would like to quote Piotrowski words written over 10 years ago, words that sound as if they have been written today. Now that Poland is undergoing civiliza civilization transformation, that the shape and uh, value system of our society are being decided, that the options of open versus authoritarian society are clashing with each other. I strongly believe that we need art as much as we do oxygen, an art that will shake us out from the root of conventional seeing and thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marit. We will now like head straight on to Sarah Wilson, um, as we are a bit running behind our scheme. Sarah, the podium is yours. Um, Sarah will introduce two Polish artists in two exhibitions in London to us. And, um, and yeah, there come her slides. Thank you. Could you please clean up the screen? and tell me if I have to tell you or just press a button here. Okay, um, let me just, I can't go on. So you, you do it, okay, right. <clears throat> yes, I'm going to present to you today two Polish artists, one of whom, uh, Martin Dudek, his exhibition Steps and Marches was in the Adel Asante Gallery in London in 2017. He actually lives and works in Brussels and Iwa Axelrad, whose exhibition Stama uh, was presented at Copperfield Gallery, again run by a former Courtauld art historian, at exactly the same time in November, in November 2017. Axel, Axelrad is a Polish artist living in London, as so many Polish people do. And her work Stama, the word means boys' solidarity or group aggression. Next slide, please. This is the installation of Martin Dudek's um, show to which I'll return. Two art exhibitions curated as installations <clears throat> with remarkable and complementary poetics, entirely separate from the political propaganda, media images, and their mediation, which is part of the material with which they work. Next one, please. I first saw Eva's work at a remarkable exhibition at the Hannah Barry Gallery, some of you may know, in Peckham uh, Rye Car Park. Uh, I came to it at sunset, where her papier mache recreations of the lions in Trafalgar Square gave me, because precisely of their scale, a visceral sense of recognition. I'm going to talk a lot about the visceral, that gut feeling in my, in my talk. So I thought, who is this? And that's how I discovered Eva Axelrad. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. <coughs> Only last week, the Polish ambassador to the UK, Avkadi Rzgogski, I don't pronounce his name properly, begged Poles in the Guardian newspaper after his radio interview to seriously consider leaving the UK. There were 832,000 Polish people living in the UK in 2018. 116,000 have already left, but only 27% have been um, worried enough to register for their new kind of settled status uh, legitimacy in the terrible contemporary Brexit pro uh, climate. And because, of course, you know what we're all going to be talking about, uh, just to show you, next slide, please, the uh, Ai Weiwei installation co combining with Freeze Art Fair in London at this very moment, where out of Lego pieces, he's created monumental um, acknowledgements, not tributes, but world publicity. Again, this is just simply the front page of the report about... Whoops, I, I didn't mean go on, but anyway, that the Ai Weiwei... Ah! <laughs> 
The Ai Weiwei was the corroborated report of Russian interference in the American intellections. Okay, next one, please. So, of course, here we get to the evil genius of Cambridge Analytica, the CEO of whom, Alexander Nix, surprise, surprise, also went to Eton, along with David Cameron and Boris Johnson, the very famous boys' public school which teaches men to rule empire, although in the present digital climate they get a bit out of their depth, of course. And its logo was this, was, no, just, if I point, I don't mean next one. If I wiggle my finger, I mean next one, okay? I'm pointing to this. This is the logo of Cambridge Analytica, which looks both like a network and a brain, which has been adopted by an anti-Cambridge Analytical thing to show you honey traps, in his case, promising beautiful Ukrainian girls to people, um, grossly unethical, illegal data mining, so on and so forth. And um, he is wearing the English poppy here, which commemorates the First World War, which is showing that he's a member of the establishment as well. Very particular. Um, okay, next slide, please. This is my heroine, um, along with Gina Miller, Carol Cadwalla, the Guardian journalist who exposed Cambridge Analytica only uh, one year ago. She's been reflecting on the current situation you can see that there is this established criminal electoral fraud, which for some reason the judiciary do not pursue, that the whistleblowers, we've had that word twice now, there are two in this case, Christopher Wiley and Shamir Sanini, two young men who face a lot of personal threats, have not been given proper media coverage, including by the BBC. And of course, there's the whole Nigel Farage links to Steve Bannon and Trump and so forth. And what is interesting from a kind of mythological point of view is that, next one please, is that um, in 2018, before now, the figure who had no face, Dominic Cummings, the media genius behind Cambridge Analytica, Analytica had already, if you like, become art, thanks to Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, um, playing him in the film called The Uncivil War. Incidentally, there is a kind of class issue here as well, because while um, Dominique Cummings also went to Oxford, he did not go to Eton and did not go to the right college. And there's a master-servant dialectic here. He went to Brazenose. He doesn't wear the right clothes, going on between Johnson and him, to which I will return. So um, truth into art before he revealed his face, because if I could have the next one, please. Dominic Johnson is now revealed as the devil behind the dunce. You see the dunce's cap with a D, the dunce Johnson. So there is this who is King Lear, who is the fool, uh, age-old scenario going on. But of course, the stakes, despite, as we've said today, the carnivalesque as aspect, are very, very serious. Um, I was interested in this, um, at least in 2015, I started to go into the kind of intellectual history of thinking about crowds and populism. So I'm going to have a quick whoosh to get back to my two poles, if you will allow me, simply because the progression is very interesting and involves art history, our discipline. Um, next slide, please. Of course, everyone knows this very, very famous frontispiece to Hobbes' Leviathan of 1651, where the benign monarch or sovereign actually contains the mass of citizen subjects who are incorporated, literally brought into his body to create the body politic. But the important thing to point out is this was created at the time of the English Civil War, a mirror for our times, with class against class, and interestingly enough, Protestants against Catholics, and the austerity of severe Puritanism against the extravagance, the extravagant display of formerly Catholic aristocrats. So you see how it goes on. So if we get to the next British uh, thought about this, this is rather interesting. Next one, please. This is hopping to a Scot, actually. Uh, 1841, Charles Mackay, Extraordinary Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Now, this is not the subject of Hobbes, which was about um, the structure of legitimate government. It's about how irrationality comes in. It's about the crazes for tulips, burning witches, uh, if you think that that was irrational at the time. <coughs> the South Sea bubble, huge investment in something that didn't exist. Um, a group, uh, a group think, and so forth. 
So going on, when we get to the idea of the, after the invention of the discipline of psychology, the study of the psyche, next one please, we get Gustave Le Bon, his psychology of the crowd, widely of course translated in 1895. But what I came to discover is that in almost each case, these intellectuals who'd written about crowd psychology were people who'd personally experience the visceral horror of seeing rampaging crowds, in his case, not only the Franco-Prussian War, but the conflagrations of Paris at the time of the Commune, the uh, Communards setting fire to the Tuileries and so forth. And of course, once he'd written the book, it was immediately taken up. Guess who? By the military, with their idea of creating the ideal esprit du corps, the fighting body, and by um, the early discipline of criminology as well. Next one, please. Now we get into the, in, in the modern period, George Sorel's reflections on violence uh, came from the position of someone who was a revolutionary syndicus, syndicalist in class struggle and revolution. And his book was very important for the futurists, as I'll show you, whereas re-editions in 1921 Yes, 1921 and 1937 were important for Walter Benjamin. So if we could just have the next, I know I'm slightly off target for one second, but I think this is very interesting. If you compare these two Italian paintings, you have Giuseppe Palizzo de Volpedo's fourth estate of the march of the uh, proletariat claiming its rights, but the almost algorithmic description of the psyche kind of transcending the form in Carlo Carra's Funerist of the Anarchist Galley, where protesters at a funeral had encountered a lot of um, police brutality and so forth with and become weaponized and so forth. But it's interesting how what I was taught was simply futurist lines of force are actually really at this very turn of the century describing a kind of algorithmic logo that is transcending individual things. And they were inspired by Jules Romain, a French poet, his idea of unanimism, from which stems the word unanimously, thinking with one mind. So it's interesting to go back to this beginning of modernism. And then in terms of those re-editions of Sorel, the next two, please, um, if we look at the popular front processions of 1935, everybody was joyously behaving themselves, tracing their protests into a lineage going back to Voltaire and Courbet, from a painter's point of view to Paul Stignac, who is still on the cards. And yet, two years later, and in fact all the time, these joyous demonstrations, I liked very much the idea of tipping this morning, were tipping into violence. And here we have... Um, um, an aerial view, maybe from a police archive, of protests in 1937 uh, to do with, again, the victim of police brutality, where Walter Benjamin writes, and this is a nice change from going on and on and on about reproduction in 1936. He writes for a critique of violence in 21 and his thoughts on a critique of violence in this context of 37, where he asks when and under what conditions a legal action must convert itself into an illegal action and an illegal action into a violent act. So three more blokes to go before I get back to my two Polish exhibitions. Next two, please. These ones of absolutely massive importance. On the left, your own Berliner, Willy Munzenberg, who moved with the burning of the Reichstag to Paris to direct the world communist, uh, common turn propaganda movement. As far as we're talking about world operations of Cambridge Analytica and so forth, this was about as ambitious as you could get, the Soviet common turn uh, thing which percolated every form of uh, new media, press, film, uh, and so forth. Uh, Willy Munzenberg was, of course, a very um, initially noble anti-fascist who in the end renounced Stalin and having published this book, Propaganda as a Weapon, in France by the Edition du Carrefour. In France, he was uh, murdered and it was fate suicide in 1940. Now this book coming out in France in 37 was very important for another Soviet émigré, Sergei Chakutin, whose book here in French, Le viol des foules par la propagande politique, means the rape of the crowds 
by political propaganda. This was immediately pulped when the Nazis invaded Paris. But what's interesting here in terms of these different disciplines coming together to study how to mind rape is that he wrote this critical, obviously, book as someone who trained as a biologist under Pavlov in the Soviet school of reflexology. So he's bringing that to bear on this issue of, if you like, mind rape. But actually, in English, it was called the psychology of totalitarian propaganda. Um, so last person who gives his title to my talk, Elias Canetti, <clears throat> His Crowds and Power, which came out in the 60s and was curiously anthropological, I thought, when I read it, was actually um, a kind of very bulked out intellectual anthropological reflection, which was in fact inspired by his witnessing of Nazi demonstrations in Vienna when he was very much younger, which had fed into his first novel, um, <clears throat> um, which was called sorry, previous page, Die Blendung, about mob action, group thinking, and individual pathologies. So interestingly enough, if we come forward into the kind of childhood, next one please, book reading, <clears throat> that was going on for Eva Axelrad, my second Polish artist, in post-war Poland, and now I understand post-war Germany, William Golding's Lord of the Flies, about what happens when you get a group of isolated adolescent boys and you leave them in a, in a, in a place together in a very anarchical, unhierarchical way, was very important for Eva Axelrad. Uh, and her thinking uh, as a TV serial as well in Poland. And of course, finally, another of my very big academic heroes, still so little known in some fields, Klaus Theolite, who comes from, as you know very well, the German situation and publishes this important book dealing with the Nazi past. I'm going very quickly. I hope I'm not to offend people by my quick summaries about male fantasies and what we now call the construction of masculinity. This has had a huge impact in huma humanities disciplines, um, such as you know, English literature and the poetry of the First World War. But unfortunately, <coughs> while toxic masculinity is today's phrase, and obviously is the dialectical other of the Me Too movement, it has not percolated his lessons, his thought, the thoughts of the British political establishment. So back to Martin Dudek. Next one, please. And what is so interesting about him is he began in Poland as a poor boy who was a football supporter of the Polish Krakowia football team, living in a, in a high-rise flat whose excitement was to go out with the boys, uh, whose team bomber jacket lining was orange. And so you entered this extraordinary installation through a turnstile, as though you too were going into a kind of orange haze and into a football match. And on the wall, you see a cast of his brother's trousers. It's called Well Washed, the very cast in plaster, the very, very day his brother at one of these football matches was stabbed in the leg. So he's coming into this rather restricted gallery art scene, which I think is an experimental crucible as opposed to the street, with that experience behind him. Next one, please. And this is an installation shot giving you a, some trauma. And the two uh, uh, sculptures I'm going to talk about again. Next one, please. So what is interesting about the sculpture on the right, which is called... Um, which is a, this is a lead cast of the stadium football terraces. I like the, the very beautiful way that this riffs on modernism and postmodernism and the bronze sculpture and the sculptural plinth. And the next two, please, next one. And this one here is so interesting because it's cast of a Soviet army helmet as worn by the Polish police force when they're policing football demonstrations and beating people up. Very, very useful repurposing of Soviet army helmets. And his own knitted balaclava that he put on, of course, to look anonymous when he was a football supporter. 
Next one, please. So he has also kept a lot of photo uh, photographic evidence of all this, and he had a very marvelous um, video screening of pixelated photographs in which the focus would change all the time, and you didn't know which crowd, as it were, were doing what. Was it, was it, you know, who were the uh, victims, who were the perpetrators, who were the police? I'm not going to play you a video, which I could, but it kind of sparkled and gave animation to the installation. And next one, and he kept his own photo journals of um, uh, his research using police surveillance as well as footage. And he was inspired not by the people I've been talking about, but interestingly enough in terms of the conference, by a book published in 1967, taking us back to the other dark side of the summer of love, Raymond Monboise's Riots, Rev Revolts and Insurrections, which was interestingly enough reviewed at that time in 67, in conjunction with a book called Prelude to Riot, A View of Urban America from the Bottom taking us back to the behavior of the so-called, and in this case, American underclass. So there are lots of issues there that are going into this displaced Polish, now artist's agenda when he makes the exhibition. Next one, please. Um, that's the next one. I think the popular art is the popular art of the football pitch, personally. You see the orange here of the orange football supporters. Next one, please. And this is, the is his performance called Hooligan in his Brussels gallery. In, I mean, this is a photographic record of him actually smashing the gallery up like a footballer. But what I, like a football hooligan, not like a footballer. But what I think is interesting here is physiologically how he would be reliving the mixture of adrenaline and testosterone and so forth that he had before he was an artist and is, is kind of harnessing those and bringing those into the gallery space. So on to Eva Axelrod, and what is interesting here is the change to a female artist and how she addresses Oh, that's some Polish hooligans for you, which we saw in the last one as well. And in this very terrible climate, which all Polish emigres in England are uh, switching back into when they watch their local news and so forth. Could I have the next one, please? Um, she does a very, very much more calmer, beautiful, deliberately even contemplative installation. On the right is a kind of installation of flagpoles, making a kind of sign, curse, sign, wave. Uh, and you can see on the end a still from what at the other end of the gallery is a video and this wax torso. Next one, please. Uh, that's okay. That's the wave of flagpoles. Next one, please. Uh, this, as a video, is this kind of male bonding scene where they're all going around like this, getting themselves into the mood, as indeed do rugby players on the field and football players when they've scored their goal. And many of you here, although not me, must know what this feels like. But this is the sort of image that she was using, juxtaposed with the piercing of that wax torso in the video. So you see this pierced body, which inevitably evokes religious Im Im imagery, the piercing of St. Sebastian, for example. And next one, please. And very movingly, this placing of a finger into a wound on the torso. One doesn't know if this is a female, you know, a, a female version of a gesture which, of course, recalls doubting Thomas in the Bible. So she is bringing this Catholic, highly contested Catholic imagery into her work, but in a way which I think is infinitely complex and sensitive, in a way which distinguishes art from propaganda. I do want to talk about that difference, and which also implies the vulnerability of these male individuals or singularities, if you like to use the word we were thinking about this morning. Next one, please. She also produced these very, very small scale, very delicate little implements on a rack that looked like almost toothpicks, but they are actually bearing the fascist, the different fascist insignia in the plural of the people on those fascist strikes. Um, and she says herself in her gallery um, brochure that these are actually the insignia um, for these demonstrations. 
um, <clears throat> and suggest the brotherhood of arms. So, of course, I'm not speaking, next one, please, I'm not speaking from the point of an imperialist or um, imperialist or a Brit or somebody talking about Polish people. I want most specifically to say how in Britain over the last uh, two or three years we've been sharing these disturbing things, sharing fascist insignia when we see news of our own right-wing demonstrations, how we have this similar types of racism, not Polish anti-Semitism, but very strong racism in the country. We have women artists and women, not women artists, women involved, as you saw in the last slide. Sorry, my gestures are getting a bit ambiguous. Don't change. And the violence. This is violence outside Westminster. And as you know, well, as some of you know, Boris Johnson has put in a huge budget for police control for the violence which he anticipates uh, at the moment when we move out of the market. Well, there will be violence, of course, and it's getting very, very, very bad. So I'm, 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 this, is, um, this is about Britain at the moment as much as it's about Polish artists and one Polish artist whose status is now severely menaced. Um, next one, please. I'm ending, I'm ending. Next one, please. Woohoo! Right, so we get back to the concept of is everything just symptomatic or do you need a mastermind? <laughs> This is indeed Dominic Cummings himself out of the closet um, at the recent uh, This Week Tory party conference where Get Brexit Done was the logo. And I want to um, throw two more slides to, at you for contemplation. This is the fact that we can't just talk about politics and populism without leaders who are not necessarily wonderful leaders, but people in whom things crystallize, who can give voice to things, and who actually lead, you know, like the Führer. So we know that there is a problem to do with personalities. My last piece by Eva Axelrad, a very, very light, fluffy, a very, very light little puffer jacket. It's called Gorilla. It's asking, who is the asshole here? I think after the last paper, I think Dominic Cummings could do with an anal sex workshop. It might solve our nation's problems. Um, and last of all, yes, we're going to all go on the streets again, ordinary middle class people, intellectuals, protesting against Brexit on October the 19th, if not indeed before. It was the tediousness down here that is spurred the slogan, get Brexit done, brutal ruin of economies, xenophobic, intolerant tediousness. And of course, the last time I came to Berlin, could I possibly imagine that I would be giving this paper just such a little, little time ago? Um, I've said here, tedium, get Brexit done, is now a very great danger, not just for us all, but our European friends, the Europeans living in Britain, the Polish artists living in Britain, of course, the British living in Europe, uh, and the, co the whole post-war, uh, Cold War consensus of the whole body politic. Thank you. So, thank you, Marek. Thank you, Sarah, for two, um, well, very inspiring and very interesting and very different talks. Um, and the, the common topic of, um, of Polish art in times of populism, just like to bring them together, um, did unfold in a very interesting way. And Sarah, I was sad that there wasn't enough time. I would have liked you to quote from the books you, who you refer to and bring them more into today's discussion, as I thought some of them were really interesting, certainly the ones I did not know. Um, but I would like to start with a question more to Marek Wasilewski now that was about Jacek Adamas. Um, what I found so interesting about this artist, whom I would know by name, but never knew that he had this proper artistic background, and as um, the topic of how things tip, I, I found this figure very interesting, because obviously he tipped in a way. And would, can you describe, if, has he been like that when he went to art school? Had he been someone who propagated right ideas? Like, what happened? 
to kind of change him in that way. Okay, so this is uh, you know a difficult question because you have to go uh, inside someone's mind. Uh, I can only say what I know about him. Uh, I know that he is a graduate of the uh, Academy of Arts in Warsaw, uh, the famous class of Grzegorz Kowalski. And uh, as far as I know, his biography, he was uh, always uh, very politically engaged. Uh, also in uh, the underground in the 80s, uh, printing uh, uh, the illegal press for solidarity. Uh, so there was always this engagement and uh, the solidarity movement was uh, uh, very complicated because on one side it was uh, workers' movement, uh, it was uh, uh, the unions' movement, on the other side it was uh, uh, very much connected with Catholic Church and conservative values. Uh, on another side, you had uh, uh, leftist intellectuals like, like Jacek Kuroń or Adam Miknik. Uh, so it was a kind of kaleidoscope where all parts of Polish society uh, kind of came together against the common enemy. Uh, and uh, I can only assume that part of this biography then uh, it made some kind of, you know, impact on, on his later choices. Uh, when he, uh, he decided to leave Warsaw to go to the countryside, uh, where he started to be a local activist, fighting uh, real, you know, uh, local uh, uh, governments who were doing things, you know, were corrupted, doing things against people, and then I could sense this kind of anger that was growing in him, uh, which uh, in the end, in this turning date, which uh, is the 2010, uh, the moment when people took the sides, uh, the point of no return, as you could say, that he flipped to, the, to this, uh, I would say, dark side. So the kind of rhetorically counter figure to this would be to me Martin Dudek, whom you were talking about, who was someone like combating in front of football arenas and now turning this into, into art. So can you tell us a bit more what made him choose a career as an artist and is this linked to him coming to Great Britain or did he come to Great Britain well, as an um, artist? Well, he, he was discovered as an artist, I don't know <coughs> in, in what show or how, by um, this young gallerist, Jeremy Epstein. And he does not live in England, you see. He lives in Brussels. And, uh, but he trained, which I think is very important actually in terms of people, as it were, quickly absorbing the right types of theory and also if you like if you want to be more cynical speaking the right kind of language he was trained for two years uh, at central st martin school of art in london from 2005 to 2007 but what interests me as a critic and i didn't have time to either express my own um, impasse or my own um, commitment to understanding as you say more about the person because there's the uh, criticism you can do when you walk into the art gallery and you think the works plus the labels speak for themselves but I'm actually always interested in what actually produced the work of art in terms of not just an artist's training, but the emotional and intellectual nexus which spurred them. And I'm afraid to say that he's so successful that although I've also encountered a very splendid work he did in Palermo last year, um, he never has enough time to talk to me in a very deep way about that transformation. I think when we were having a little word together just now, I said, of course I'm aware that Armand also smashed up a gallery in New York as a work of art. But I think then Armand was kind of re-performing um, an inner rage he'd had in Paris at the time of the Algerian War that's too complex and not transportable to New York. Whereas I think in this, the kind of proximity of the events and also this idea of the physical action uh, and this very great violence permitted by the gallery. Um, and when the artist himself is reenacting, I think it's very interesting. 
and it, it, it puts into question the artist himself's self-formation and self-control and desires to get out of what he must have seen as an impasse, you know, a, a no future type life that mm -hmm. he has managed to get out of. It raises all sorts of questions for how we as critics or historians approach the artist where they're biography and their subjectivity and their emotional investment in what they're doing, their libidinal energy, if you like, affects things as well as simply the work of art in the gallery. Well, still, I found that opposing the two, we, we, we really only had two or three images, but I found the way in which um, Dudek turned the football um, memorabilia, the clothes and the signs, so striking against Adamas, who somehow took the language of this conceptual, partly fig figurative and very um, literate art against it. And I found it was a very similar movement, um, which created totally different art experiences in the end. And, and I found that with these two names that you were talking about, you somehow really framed what we were looking for in this lecture to say how, how close and how different these art activities can be at a certain point. So I found that really striking and, um, and I would like to um, now learn a bit more about why you framed, Sarah, why you framed this work so um, intensively in the um, and the discussion about street protest and revolt. Sorry, the, how I framed... There was a lot of anger visible uh, in your... Yeah, yeah. yes. Um, well, I suppose, um, I suppose if you think of that earliest work, that earliest Italian work, um, the artist... Um, I can, I'm sorry, I can never remember the Carla Palozzi. Uh, before all the futurists whose names we know, was finding it imperative to stop painting nudes and salon pieces and actually imperative to give uh, proletarians on the march the status of a history painting. So he's doing this and you're actually in front as though you are the establishment with the people coming at you. So his imperative was, if you like, to record what was on the street in the same way as the futurists who were taking art. I mean, cubism is all to do with cafe life, even if you're reading newspapers about the Balkan War, to get out of the confines of the inside onto the outside and make the street the subject. Uh, but that is um, not, as it were, quite before performance art, but Dada and things, and the way we've just seen here, Dada gets kind of absorbed into Bauhaus world. Dada doesn't really... It, Dada is essentially impotent. It's in Zurich when all the action is happening on the trenches. So there's a whole history. I mean, there's, I wanted to say this morning, of course, there's a whole history of scatology in art, you know, using shit in art, including in futurism. There's a whole history of everything. But I think... Um, what is interesting with Dudek is that instead of restaging, um, instead of saying I want to be a performance artist or I want to go on the street or I want to be the Polish Petra Pawlensky or something, he actually wants to use the frame, which is a frame which invites contemplation as well. It's like slow everything at the moment, slower contemplation, slower thought. He wants to use that gallery space to do something very powerful. And normally when you go into, we all go into galleries all the time, you don't get the sense of being in an erratic space where everything is part of the same thought process. And that's what really struck me when I first saw his work. And strangely enough, with the lions in Trafalgar Square on top of the car park, um, what was very strange was the kind of transfer of erratic space and the messing up of the feelings, including feelings of embarrassment um, at kind of big pompous British monuments when you're in Trafalgar Square, which is the traditional place of protest, um, and the transposing of that. So that's outside. So there's an inside-outside element which I think is interesting because just looking at the outside takes you away from the head and I think the gallery is putting is a space where you can have a kind of enlarged head to think about things more contemplatively 
And I really love Eva's work. I think it's, I mean, she can do the monumental. We begin with the lions. She can do big, and she can do very, very small. And she can make criticisms about her position as a, as a woman without using overused languages of feminism in inverted commas or whatever. Have these two artists been displaying in Poland? Uh, I have to ask you that. <laughs> I don't know about Dudek, but uh, Eva Axelrad, definitely, she has ties with, with Poland and uh, also with the University of Arts in Poznań, where I teach. Oh, so yeah, so, well, it's too much to say we are friends, but we know each other. Well, now you might be friends. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, before I open the podium for questions, I have one question, last question myself to Marek, which is about you, you talked in a very interesting way about how the, um, how justice and state in Poland now found new ways of, um, of censorship. And, um, and you talked about how, how they can, as long as you have two people who feel offended, they can, they can steer up, um, they can steer up um, some, some kind of media battle at least, or even, um, but how does this affect the um, art institutions? Because we are so much talking here about the media and the public and the arts, but um, can you just in, in, in some sentences outline if that affects the institutions and what kind of policies behind this? Yes, I think that the whole picture is, is quite complicated. When you say censorship, uh, I'm thinking about the times before 89, uh, when the division was very clear, there was uh, an office of censorship, official office, uh, and it was uh, just censoring things. So you knew very well what you can do and what you cannot do, and if you want to uh, publish or show something that is illegal, then you have to go underground. Uh, nowadays, situation is very complex because officially there is no censorship. But then you have to think twice before you engage in a, you know, showing or discussing works that are critical towards religion because people can be felt offended. And uh, also there is growing pressure uh, from the government, uh, from the Ministry of Culture on not showing certain things. And this is a, a pressure of money. They just refuse foundings. Uh, in Poznań, for example, there was, uh, there is still going on a, a very well-known theater festival. And uh, when uh, they uh, add in their program uh, plays uh, that were not liked by the Ministry of Culture, then the minister uh, just withdrew the financial support from the festival, uh, which is funny. Uh, still we have a situation when uh, uh, the case went to the court and the minister had to pay uh, the money, uh, but that was two years after, uh, so it was already too late. Yes, so uh, we don't have this kind of you know, clear censorship. Uh, but you can see that this uh, field of freedom uh, is getting smaller and smaller. And uh, this is why uh, we are very uh, anxious and looking forward to the next week elections in Poland, because uh, many commentators say that these are the most important elections uh, in 30 years, because everything can change for good uh, after these elections. So I would now like to open the podium for questions. Um, do we have a microphone? Yeah. And would you be so kind to introduce yourself to us? Um, hello, my name is uh, Clara Kemp Welsh. I'm a colleague of Sarah Wilson's um, from London. I'm an art historian. Uh, my question is um, for um, Marek uh, Vasilevsky. Um, I thought your analysis was you know, very clear. Um, about the evolution of the um, strategy of populism in Poland and um, you uh, showed many examples of how um, 
very polarized everything has become. Obviously, this is something that's very much on our minds in England as well. And the language of polarization and the violence of that language was something which was in the media last week when uh, Boris Johnson started using particular language to talk about a bill which had been passed through Parliament. So I was uh, struck by your use of the term the dark side just now <laughs> to talk about um, an artist having gone over to the dark side. And um, so I think that the analysis of these um, strategies is important, but I would be more interested to hear examples of artists and artworks who have sought to build dialogue across these two seemingly utterly um, polarized, impossible to um, bring together groups. And um, thinking of an example myself of that, um, I, it made me think of Artur Żmijewski's um, very famous video work, Oni, Them, uh, where he brought together representatives of different extreme groups in Polish um, society, um, very importantly for a non-linguistic encounter um, where they were to uh, use pictures and illustrations to show what they thought about the other group and it led to violence. And there was um, the kind of the use value potentially of an art as a non-linguistic form, which was also why the examples that Sarah gave were so powerful, because both of them mobilized affect and touch and so on, rather than language. So could you perhaps think of some examples of um, Polish contemporary works which have sought to foster dialogue? Thank you. Uh, okay, this is a very interesting question and perhaps it requires a different presentation uh, because obviously uh, the logic of this presentation was the analysis of the populist language. Uh, I think that the example of Artur Zmijewski is uh, quite controversial because uh, I think that the situation that we are facing right now in Poland is uh, very binary. You can be on this side or you can be on the other side. If you are trying to build a bridge uh, in the middle of the war, uh, then actually you're condemned by both sides. Uh, so uh, these voices, I think, are very, very weak right now. Uh, I am convinced that uh, the art you're talking about uh, has a very good future. Uh, uh, but it's not very visible right now in, in Poland. Uh, as a quick example, I can, uh, a pity I cannot show the slide, uh, but there is a young artist, uh, Franciszek Orłowski, uh, for example, whose uh, work is mostly about empathy, about reaching to, to the other, about uh, discovering uh, the others in, in many different performances and, and visual, visual works. He, he is doing exactly uh, what you're talking about. Hello, my name is Frida Sandström. I'm from Stockholm. Um, I wanted to follow up on your exemplification and perhaps also look back on what we talked about this morning, or not me, but... Um, what the speakers talked about this morning in terms of singularities. And uh, perhaps it's also important to think about examples that are not individual artworks, but rather um, organizations in between fields, as I think is one of the threads we've been following so far for this uh, uh, Congress. And I was thinking about the Warsaw Biennale that opened, had its inaugural um, uh, edition this summer, which uh, explicitly um, in text and in practice did uh, present itself as a way to use the Biennale structure f to mobilize, um, specifically in Poland, uh, in relation to exactly what you were presenting. Um, so I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And then, Sarah, I wanted also to ask you in relation to this artist uh, that you brought up, or um, in, uh, uh, in Kiev, Two years ago, uh, the artist David Shishkan did, did, made an exhibition that was explicitly critiquing the, um, the right-wing governance in his country. Uh, and this one was uh, totally demolished by new Nazis um, that uh, did 
uh, invade the gallery and and basically destroy all his works, but and also spraying a lot of tags and writing a lot of Nazi, new Nazi symbols on the walls. Uh, and this exhibition was taking place in the Visual Culture Research Center that first was also um, hosted by the uh, the University of Kiev, the art school, but it was also due to political art being exhibited by the the, the center. It was also had to move out from the from the university, uh, and uh, they had a, like when they had this um, uh, thing happening in the gallery, they decided to keep the exhibition exactly as it was. So they continued to exhibit the works with uh, um, all the violence that had had entered the room. Uh, I'm also, so I'm, for me, there are big differences between the work that you presented and this uh, event and that type of changed exhibition. I'm curious if you could comment a little bit on that. So I have, it was one for you each. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. So I'll just be quick. Uh, uh, I'm thinking right now about a very interesting gallery, Labyrinth in Lublin. Uh, which organized two uh, very interesting exhibitions. Uh, I think four years ago it was an exhibition called Democracies. And right now they have an exhibition that is called Free Plagues. And in the occasion of, of both exhibitions they organized uh, big discussion panels involving uh, artists from all over Poland coming especially to this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, especially to talk about the language of reconciliation uh, with the so-called other side, but also uh, it was a discussion about uh, how our audience is limited only to those who think in the same way as, as we are. Uh, and I think these were very interesting discussions. Unfortunately, uh, we are still, you know, without the answer, uh, without good answer to these questions, but I think this is a work in progress. Um, thank you. I don't know the um, exhibition you're talking about in Kiev. It sounds very interesting. I'll look it up. But of course, all this is inscribed in an immensely long history of iconoclasm. Uh, and of course, there's a very interesting intersection between uh, thinking about populism and not just people burning down you know, other people's flags or whatever, but um, iconoclasm, and of course in the English Civil War, if we think back to Hobbes, um, um, Cromwell's soldiers absolutely, well, were ordered for a start to put all their horses and stables and manure inside all the churches and then smash up all the Catholic saints on the front of the cathedral facades. So um, there's a whole enormous tradition, which is also to do with, I mean, it's like the, um, you know, I, I'm very fond of Sophie Kahl's project, going back to Berlin, called Die Entfernung. So when the two Germanies uh, reunited, all sorts of uh, monuments were banished to the woods. I mean, there were three categories. There are the minutes in the back of the catalogue. It's art, gallery art, about whether things were to be displaced to a forest, smashed up and destroyed, uh, and, you know, just the pieces thrown away, or um, smashed up and buried, or whatever. But it was, a, it was an extremely bureaucratic process of people thinking what they liked, what they didn't like. And she, her project was to record people's response to the absences. So one's not just simply talking about religion, but, it, it, but the, a, a, a long history of, of iconoclasm, either done by individuals taking out their fury on something, which gets us back to this whole business of emotion and objects and dis the desire to destruct, or um, state-ordered destruction. So, um, and, and of course, state orders can be, please smash this Madonna, or it can be, please smash the city of Dresden. Uh, so, you know, there's a, we're, 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 we're kind of talking about scales and tippings, but there's the macro scale, and there's the micro scale. But so it's interesting to think of iconoclasm and populism as being two sides of the same coin. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Sadly enough, I mean, like if you uh, want to, if we will have to end with iconoclasm. As I was, no, I was reminded that we are totally over our time. We will have to learn that long lectures mean no time for the audience. But um, thank you very much. It's been especially, I, I really liked the lectures you gave. And um, thank you for your contribution.